You may have heard about the Swiss referendum to end fractional reserve lending by Swiss commercial banks. It's really a fascinating development for Austrians and libertarians, and it's another example of how average Swiss people can use referenda to force both their central legislature and the 26 Swiss cantons to consider their proposals, merely by gathering 100,000 signatures within an 18-month period. So here to help us understand this from a Swiss perspective is Claudio Gross, a good friend of the Mises Institute, a principal with the Swiss company Global Gold, and a Rothbardian with a great understanding of money and banking issues. But because the Volgeld Initiative may be new to you, a bit of background is in order. Now the referendum, which is popularly known as the Volgeld Initiative, would require banks to hold 100% reserves against their deposits. So in other words, commercial banks would become, in effect, money warehouses, albeit in this case holding both physical and electronic currency. And this is something many libertarians and Austrians have long favored. But while the initiative sounds like a positive step toward ending the expansionary pressures of a now almost entirely fiat Swiss franc, and a happy development for libertarians who consider fractional reserve banking fraudulent, the reality, it turns out, is more complicated. Austrian economists simply say, end central banking and let the market decide, treat money as a commodity. The Volgeld Initiative says, however, let the central bank decide absolutely. This is the philosophy of the Swiss sovereign money movement that's actually behind Volgeld, which is a loose coalition of anti-capitalist and anti-banking groups that certainly don't want money to operate as a market commodity. On the contrary, the sovereign money movement wants to give the Swiss National Bank, in conjunction with the Swiss government, absolute monopoly control over money creation. Money, they argue, is so important that it has to be issued and run only by the sovereign, which is a curious term in a country that has fully rejected monarchs at least since its federal constitution of 1848. So it evidences, perhaps, the same kind of loyalist fervor for centralized state control that European subjects once showed for their kings and queens. In this sense, the Swiss sovereign money movement has an American cousin known, of course, as greenbackers, a phenomenon I discuss during the interview with Claudio. Now, greenbackers in the U.S. also want sovereign control over money, but through Congress directly rather than through a central bank. In fact, they got their start by having the Union government pay for its Civil War military buildup by issuing unbacked currency. Now, modern-day greenbackers, including former Congressman Dennis Kucinich and his monetary policy fellow traveler Bernie Sanders, are anti-capitalist and populist. And to be fair, they correctly see that the confluence between central banks and commercial banks is an unjust enrichment scheme. But as economist Bob Murphy explains, their solution, which is open political control over money by a central legislative body, is actually deeply flawed. Now, the Volgeld Initiative comes on the heels of another referendum that the Swiss held back in 2014 that would have required the Swiss central bank to hold 20% of its bank reserves in physical gold. Note that this is a referendum that ultimately failed under heavy media pressure that was urging voters not to interfere with the Swiss National Bank's so-called independence. And these are, of course, the same arguments we hear about Fed independence here in the U.S. by opponents of, say, Ron Paul's audit the Fed bill. But still, it's fascinating that the Swiss have enough interest in monetary policy to even hold these votes. And it's almost unimaginable to think that the general public in most Western countries or in America could intelligently debate monetary policies and hold a national referendum on an issue like this. So kudos to Switzerland and the Swiss people for even venturing to hold this referendum. And stay tuned for a great interview with Claudio Gross. Well, let me ask you about the Volgeld Initiative. First and foremost, uh, it sounds like the, the sufficient signatures have been garnered that this is moving forward. We don't have a date yet for the vote. Tell us about some of the people behind this initiative, the Swiss sovereign money movement. Uh, you know, I can also tell you a little bit more uh, first about the, the political process, you know, what, what happening, what's happening right now. Okay, I mean, they have, you know, this team of Volgeld. They basically gathered mm -hmm. within 18 months uh, more than 100,000 signatories, which are necessary to, to hand in uh, an official uh, initiative. That seems like a small amount. I mean, what's the Swiss population? Uh, we are roughly 8 million people. Yeah, okay. I was, I was going to say six, but 8 million people. So that's a pretty, 100,000 is a pretty small threshold. 
Uh, that's true. But at the end of the day, you also have to go out on the street and you have to gather all these. You got to do it. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, and I think this is a fair limit. You know, I mean, we even had uh, politicians. They, of course, they want to increase uh, that number. You know, there are some. Uh, some <laughs> they don't ideas. like it. <laughs> no, definitely not, because it really keeps them under control. And um, so, so it's great stuff. I mean, right now, you know, this uh, the initiative basically it's. It will be discussed in the federal council, you know, in our executive uh, board, basically where we have these seven presidents, and and they must then within one year come up with their message to the parliament. And you know, within this message, they can say yes or no to the initiative, or they can also come up with a counter proposal. And then afterwards, you know, the initiative needs to be discussed within the parliament within the next two and a half years, and then the parliament has to vote for or against it before it is brought in front of the people. And then usually the decision, you know, um, after, you know, usually within the next 10 months, then they have to conduct uh, the national poll. And the decision by the parliament, that's an, I think it's an important one, it, it has no binding character and it only acts as a recommendation for the, for the Swiss people. So it's a long, it's, it's a long process. You know, that's the, that's the beauty of, uh, of Switzerland. You know, everything takes time. <laughs> Well, so tell me about the groups behind this. I, I suspect that it's not a it's not a libertarian movement per se. Well, no, not at all. I mean, I, I met some of those people because last year I had I was invited at a panel where we discussed, you know, the gold initiative versus the full geld or the full geld initiative. And so I also met, uh, you know, the the guy who founded the committee. His name is Hans Rudi Weber. So he's a retired teacher, and he has some, uh, you know, intellectual in in his teams uh, from the University of St. Gallen, which is a, a private university in Switzerland, which seems to be a kind of of nest when it comes to that topic. So I mean, uh, you know, also the people, I mean, most of their campaigners, for example, they all have. Uh, a, a professional background in, in social occupations, you know, of all sorts. I mean, we are talking about pedagogues, coaches, teachers, psychologists, actors, uh, journalists, you know, we have government employees, of course, local singers and some political politicians from left wing parties. So overall, you know, I believe it's a fair statement to say that most of them are statist and uh, some are even inspired by communism. So so that's that's the people behind it. I mean, their motivation their main motivation was really to destroy the fractional reserve banking so that, you know, ban the, the, the banks to create money, especially, you know, what happened in the past few years uh, when it comes to the banks and its fraudulent activities. I mean, that's what they have seen. And they just thought, you know, we have to end it, you know, and, um, and that has been definitely uh, their main, main motivation. And what can be said to a certain extent is, you know, that they even share some with, you know, same, the, same, the same sorrows and fears that we also have. Um, but the only difference is that they don't realize that the biggest criminal in the history of mankind has been the state and its ruling apparatus. So they are looking for a solution on the on the wrong side. So instead of choosing you know, decentralization and privatization, they are in favor of more centralization and, and nationalization. So I think that's uh, a fair description. So it's really kind of a left wing anti bank, anti capitalism outlook. Um, yeah, I think that's. That, that's a fair statement. But, you know, here in the U.S., we have people known as greenbackers, which is a civil war term, but there's also a modern usage of that. And I think Bernie Sanders has flirted with greenbackism. And, and a greenbacker is basically someone who says, well, you know, we want to do away with the central bank and let Congress control the supply of money. Now, it sounds like the Volgeld Initiative, they want to leave this with the Swiss National Bank, but they also want the Swiss legislature to be involved in, in decisions about how new money is in Introduced. Would you say that's correct? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's it's uh, you know they, uh, I mean they only want you know that the Swiss National Bank uh, bank has the license to print, and uh, so it's it's an absolute centralization of power. And as we all know, you know power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And um, and of course, you know it's yeah. I mean they are so crazy crazy enough to believe that you know few people on the top of of, of the national bank basically can steer and monitor you know the whole economy, which is uh, I think a complete nonsense. Well, so when you look at the banks themselves, okay, and the, is certainly in Austrian and libertarian circles, there's a huge ongoing debate about whether fractional reserve. Uh, banking is inherently fraudulent or whether it's a, a legitimate market practice or would be in a, in a system with, let's say, go, you know, gold-backed money. Um, so apart from this whole debate over fractional reserve, from, from a purely libertarian standpoint, 
wouldn't a lot of people see this as a good thing because now we have banks or we would have Swiss banks initially act essentially acting as warehouses and giving you a warehouse receipt for holding your money and and charging you for the privilege. I mean, we've already seen negative interest rates on bonds in Europe. Here, I, we would presumably have bank fees. In other words, there's a lot of libertarians who say, well, this is what banks should be. They should be money warehouses, not money creators. I think, you know, we have to distinguish, of course, when it comes to the banking system, because we also need banks. And that's, as you're saying, when the problem today we have is that basically, you know, when we deposit banks on, 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 a, on a, with UBS or Credit Suisse, they basically can use that money, uh, you know, to create uh, additional currency. And that's, and that's, of course, you know, so they create it out of thin air and they can charge, you know, an interest rate for it and so on. And uh, they can decide who gets it. Uh, so and then at the same time, I mean, I have some money deposited on the bank account and I believe I have access to it at any time. And the banks is using it, uh, you know, to create uh, additional credit. And, and this is, of course, this has an inflationary effect because you always when you create more, uh, more money, for the same amount of goods, I mean, then our prices will rise. I mean, that's, you know, I mean, you're just uh, increasing the money supply. And I think that's that's the big problem. I believe, you know, we should have banks, uh, you know, like uh, where you can deposit your money and, uh, you know, the banks can keep it uh, safe and maybe they can even help you in uh, doing, you know, bank transactions and all that stuff. But then you definitely have to pay a fee for it. But you know for sure that the money is yours and they are not allowed to, to lean it out and so on. And of course, you can at the same time, you can also have a different bank, you know, which basically can say, uh, if you deposit your money, you know, we can, uh, and you, we would lean it out to the economy and then you get, you know, an interest rate, which is a kind of, you know, the risk premium, basically. Um, and then, but then you know for sure that you don't have access, you know, to your own money for, let's say, when the contract goes, uh, it's blocked for six months. Uh, it will be at disposal, you know, for for another company where the bank is lending money to. I mean, then you don't have, you know, this uh, double uh, or double or triple or, or quadruple amount of money floating into into the economy. So, um, and then of course, you know, when it comes to the minimum, uh, I mean, maybe you know, even we have to leave it up to the to the free market. I think they will find the best solution. You know, if we have a bank which we know that they only have, I don't know, a backing of forty percent. Uh, or fifty percent, uh, maybe then you get you know higher risk premium, uh, or you know if the if the bank goes bust, then uh, yeah, then you know I mean that that you're going to lose lose your money, but you you before you decided yourself that you are willing to hand it over to that particular bank, and uh, and because you received a much bigger uh, interest rate or risk premium, uh, that the bank were able to to work with it. So. I think you know we we need we need uh, we need banks competing with each other and they should have different uh, models and we should leave it up uh, you know to 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 the market and then I'm sure you know that the best money uh, and the best banks are going to survive if they don't have uh, a lender of last resort which is bailing them out at any time if they if they are in trouble or so. Well, here's what's so great about having a country of 8 million people. You can actually have a referendum and talk about fractional reserve banking. If we held a vote on something like this in the U.S., I think we would be astonished by how few people could sort of intelligently discuss or consider um, the subject matter. I'm, do you think most Swiss really understand this? It, it, you know, we, we, there's parallels. We'd recently had a vote on, on what percentage of gold reserves the Swiss National Bank would have to hold, for example. Yeah. I think, you know, I think, I mean, the whole idea of this uh, positive money uh, or, you know, what is it called? Uh, sovereign money. And uh, I think it's, 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 it's pretty nonsense. Um, so, and then it's also a bit complicated that they come up with, you know, uh, strange arguments so that they kind of even, you know, utilize the proceeds from money creation so that, for example, when a, when a bank, when you create 1,000 franc note, that the printing costs are only 30 cents. And so that they basically earn, you know, 990.70 Swiss francs uh, when they when they print the 1,000 note, uh, they can basically use that that difference uh, and, and distribute it into the economy and to the people, back to the people and so on. I mean, it's completely weird. Um, but at the end of the day, and, and that, I think that's the beauty of Switzerland, uh, is that we, we we can debate about that. And it also shows, I mean, it, it really, we had last year, we had this gold uh, initiative referendum, and now we have this full gold uh, initiative 
And it clearly shows that the people are unhappy, unhappy with the actual system. And so they are trying to find, you know, new solutions to come up with new suggestions, which I believe is, is good because it opens up the dis discussion and the debate. And, uh, and I also believe, you know, even now for us, you know, for Austrian, uh, Austrian economics and so on, I mean, there will be a debate taking place in the future. And then it's it's up to us that we can also contribute uh, positively, you know, by uh, yeah explaining, you know, how we see that the monetary system is working, how an economy is working, why do we need interest rates, where does money come from, uh, you know, why should money be a hard asset, a real asset, um, and I think that that helps, you know, the people then understanding uh, what's going on. So overall. Overall, I believe, you know, even it's, if it's a, a nonsense idea, I don't see, I don't see, the, you know, I don't see any chance that it's going to succeed. Um, but I, I like to see, you know, the, the, the public debates and discussions we're going to have. Absolutely. No, I, I think we have a parallel in America. I, I'd like to see Bernie Sanders talking openly about democratic socialism. I think I would much rather see that than have the issue obscured or, or, or have the issue discussed in a dishonest way. So I, I would much rather have it discussed openly. Uh, let me ask this. Do the Swiss people still like to use cash in their day-to-day -day lives? There used to be a stereotype of the typical German that he really tried to use cash. We're in America for quite some time, may, maybe not as much as the Swedes, but in America we've been mostly cashless for, for quite some time, at least in the non-underground economy. Yeah. Well, you know, I just saw um, uh, a slide uh, from a friend of mine, I'm seeing from Acting Man. Uh, you know, Switzerland is, is the country where the people uh, are uh, stocking the biggest, you know, the, the biggest amount of, of paper notes, of cash. So, so we are by far number one. So this means, you know, people, the Swiss people heard about, you know, cashless society. They see what's going on around them. So what they were doing, basically, they were, you know, they really uh, negative interest rates, of course, that's another topic. So they are just, you know, taking cash out and they store it somewhere. And so that's the first reaction, which is, I think, you know, uh, uh, quite a smart one. Uh, it just shows, you know, that the people love cash and they, they don't trust, you know, the government. They don't want to have a, a completely, you know, cashless society. Uh, and the, on, the, on the other side, when I talk to Swiss people about cashless society and so on, so far, I mean, you know, I mean, the majority by far, I mean, a huge majority, they are pro cash. And uh, even if they use, you know, uh, electronic, uh, you know, credit cards and so on during the day from time to time, they don't want to give up uh, cash. You know, that's cash really uh, is, is, is part of the Swiss uh, culture and, uh, and they, what they don't want to give up, uh, you know, uh, what, yeah, what, what the state is basically are planning. We have lots of gold in Switzerland, and uh, and the good stuff is, you know, I mean, the people, the Swiss people, they they see how you know governments act uh, in Germany and in France, and uh, and, uh, and and you know the way I see it is really, you know, uh, that you, the eurozone can turn uh, quite fastly into a totalitarian uh, zone, you know, where we're going to have martial law not only in France for a few months. I mean, they need a few attacks, they need a few uh, terror attacks. And, uh, and then I think the whole Eurozone is going to change uh, within a very short period of time. And uh, I even had, you know, I had discussions with people in Germany, uh, company owner, uh, entrepreneurs. And uh, I, always, I always ask them, I mean, what are you doing? I mean, do you have a plan B? Uh, and, and all of them, they had a plan B. So, I mean, they uh, even, especially you know, the people in the north, I mean, in Germany, they, they see what's going on. They see what the government is doing to them. And uh, they also understand that it's that it's not possible, you know, to finance uh, a welfare state with open borders. And, uh, and we still have, you know, militia army, and we have these debates in, in the parliament. Uh, you know, people, Swiss people basically want to have uh, more military at, uh, at the borders. So this will be, you know, this is a discussion which is going on right now. Of course, now because of winter time, you know, the, the refugee streams went down uh, a bit. But, uh, I mean, they are there. And, uh, and with, with the actual policy of bombing the Middle East back to the Stone Ages, uh, you know, what is, the, what is the normal reaction? You know, more people will come. And uh, so this is, not, this is just the beginning, what we are seeing. And, uh, yeah, so I, I really, you know, my feeling is that we really go back to the Dark Ages. I mean, that's at least a possible scenario you know, where we're going to have religious war. Uh, so it, it's, you know, I, I mean, it's, yeah, horrible, stupid. I mean, it's so stupid. Yeah, yeah. Well, people like to think of history as as pure forward progress, 
when in fact sometimes it goes sideways or even backwards for a couple hundred years, yeah. right? Yeah. So it, it's certainly possible. Okay, so in the U.S., there is this image of the Fed that it's somehow independent from Congress, independent from the president, independent from the political process. Now, we know it, that's not true, but the Fed touts its independence. In Switzerland, is there the same perspective that the Swiss National Bank is, is completely independent of the legislature and that it, it won't just do the legislature's bidding? Yeah, absolutely. It's the same. It's the same over here. But I mean, at the moment, you know, I mean, for example... And you look at the balance sheet of the Swiss National Bank, I mean, they have printed 400, trillion, 400 billions in the last, since 2008, 450, something like that. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, at the same time, we had a vote that, you know, the Swiss people were saying we don't want to add more debt. Uh, you know, we had the debt break. Uh, so, of course, but in the, in the background, of course, and the, the Assembly uh, just printed money like crazy. But I think, you know, it just shows, I mean, if, if we're going to have this full geld, uh, you know, then in the future, I mean, you don't need to... You don't need to bring in front of the people a tax hike or something you know, because yeah then they have money uh, the free money direct access so why why to bother the people you know and inflation is is yeah the toxic the toxic tax which uh, most people don't understand so i mean <laughs> therefore it's likely that they just do the same you know and and steal uh, even more from the people through greater inflation well of course in the u.s taxes have really become a non-issue in elections. I mean, if Sanders wanted to come along and start imposing some 90 percent tax on rich people, of course, they would they would scream and cry. But but in effect, I mean, who cares if Hillary's saying 35 and Ted Cruz is saying 32 percent? You know, who cares? Because the, the Fed just papers over these deficits and everyone's praising Obama yeah. for for turning, you know, for instead of spending one trillion more each year than than the government takes in the taxes, he's spending, you know, 500 billion. Yeah. And this is touted as some huge success. So uh, taxes have really become, well, I should say tax rates have really become a non-issue in the U.S. And I think that shows you the power of central banks. Absolutely. Yeah. Happy New Year, Claudio. It was great talking Thanks. to you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Same to you. Take care. Yeah.